here in the United States, massive feedlots schedule more than 135 million head of livestock for their appointments with the butcher. The lone multitasking butcher of old is nearly extinct. In his place is an army of high-speed cutters and bacteria control specialists at a mass production factory. But in a world of pre-packaged products, there's a growing movement to recapture the secrets of the old world butcher. A little over a pound and a half. At the swank Nick and Steph Steakhouse in downtown Los Angeles, patrons come to celebrate a forgotten art from the butcher's meat locker. It's called dry-aged beef. Nick and Steph's imports whole strip loins and ages them in a climate-controlled aging room for up to 21 days. What's happening is it promotes the enzymes within the beef to start breaking down the tendons and uh, muscle fiber. And in essence, what it's doing is reversing the process of the rigor mortis. So it's actually loosening up the, the meat and tenderizing it. Some dry-aged steaks sell for as high as $50 per 10-ounce cut. Their high cost is a direct result of shrinkage. As the beef ages, the outer surface decays and surface bacteria must be removed. Extracting the strip steaks and ribeyes requires a skilled butcher. As you can see, it's completely broken down. High marbleization, it's completely tenderized, almost uh, completely broken down. The modern steakhouse uses retro techniques to get the best flavored steak. But our ancient ancestors didn't have the luxury of waiting for their dinner to age. There was some point or juncture or phase that our ancestors passed through where they left the trees, began to walk upright, and perhaps one of the earliest things that they did was crack stones to get an edge so they could leave the shelter of the trees, run down onto the savanna, perhaps to uh, scavenge meat from a lion kill. The latest field research indicates that our quest for animal protein goes back millions of years. Recent finds in East Africa have uh, uncovered broken animal bones that have cut marks on them. And this is a strong indication that human ancestors back two and a half million years ago were actually using stone tools to physically uh, remove meat from these animal bones. Approximately 5,000 years ago, we learned to smelt naturally occurring copper and tin together to form the alloy known as bronze. Perhaps one of the foremost innovations in prehistoric butchery was the development of metal cutting tools. Slowly, butchering evolved from a function performed for families or small nomadic groups into a service conducted for larger populations. Public slaughterhouses date back to Roman times. In 300 BC, animals were butchered in the open air at the Forum in Rome. On special occasions, wealthy Romans sometimes ate such exotic meats as giraffe and tiny mice stuffed with pine nuts. The more unusual the food, the more the guests of the host were impressed. In the Middle Ages, butchers were restricted to certain neighborhoods in which to ply their trade. This was due to the large amount of animal waste and blood. They were usually dumped into the middle of the street that served as an open sewer. On the North American continent, the nomadic nature of the native tribes didn't allow for the technological evolution occurring elsewhere. Most Native Americans used stone tools to butcher animals. Uh, fairly expedient stone tools often, just a, a sharp stone flake. This flake has long, extremely sharp edges on this side and this side, which would be just perfect for slicing meat uh, off a of bone or disarticulating animals. Uh, and this is so sharp you can actually shave with it. For the modern butcher, the knife is still the foundation for every job. And most butchers rely on just a couple of basic knives. The butcher or steak knife and the boning knife. 
one thing has remained constant since ancient times, the need for a sharp knife. One time-honored method of checking the sharpened edge is the paper test. It's sharp knife is very, very important in this business. When your knife could do this, you know you have a real good edge on it. You could cut anything. If you look at the cutting edge of a knife under a magnifying glass, it'll look almost like a hacksaw blade with a series of teeth. When you use the knife and it starts to become dull, the first thing that happens are these little teeth, or as, as we call them in the factory, feathers. These little feathers bend over to the left or the right side of the cutting edge and your knife becomes dull and you notice right away that it's, it's not cutting the way it did when it was factory fresh. In that case, you use a, a butcher steel and you go through a process of hand stealing your blade where you draw the knife blade along a hardened steel rod. What happens is that these little feathers are stood up straight. They're realigned. While basic knife shapes haven't changed much in thousands of years, manufacturing methods are certainly different today. The Dexter Russell Company in Southbridge, Massachusetts is the largest manufacturer of professional cutlery in the United States. The process of making butcher knife starts with raw steel. Steel is uh, iron with uh, carbon added. And when the percentage of carbon approaches 1%, you start to get uh, steels that are good for making cutlery. We're looking for a steel that has, first of all, enough carbon in it so that we can heat treat it. At Dexter Russell, the knife blanks are heated to 1,500 degrees, then rapidly cooled down in a specially formulated oil bath. To me, I always tell people the steel is the heart of the knife, but the heat treatment gives it its soul. The trick to heat treating is to elevate the temperature of the steel so that it changes its physical state. Subjecting the knife blank to rapid cooling leaves the blade in an extremely brittle state. So there's a final step to the heat treating process that's called tempering. Uh, tempering gives steel its, its flexibility, its springiness. We do that by putting the carbon steel into a uh, furnace at 550 degrees and soaking it at that temperature for two hours. The classic image of the butcher includes a formidable looking blade known as the cleaver. But 20th century technology made the cleaver obsolete. The cleaver was used much more because they probably didn't have a bandsaw. What they did, they used a steak knife to cut through the meat. Then they used the cleaver to cut off the bone. The electric bandsaw was introduced to the butcher in the early 20th century. The saw was a welcome advancement in the multi-million year evolution of the butcher's tools. But just decades before its introduction, forces at work in one Midwestern town would forever alter the role of the traditional butcher. At Huntington Meats in Los Angeles, the skills of the old-fashioned butcher are still in demand. This is the boneless chuck roast. I'm gonna trim it and split it here you can get whatever you'd like. In a supermarket, they tend to be price conscious because they have to compete with other supermarkets. I don't really have to compete with anybody because of the quality that I have. For centuries, the traditional butcher has dispensed skillfully prepared cuts of meat and sound advice to willing customers. Today's neighborhood butchers rarely slaughter the animal but they remain experts in all phases of getting meat from the pasture to the table. He comes out, he talks to the customer, he knows what he's cut, he's proud of what he cut. He wraps it up, people take it home. He has more personal contact with that meat all the way through the complete job. These butchers are modern survivors whose predecessors crossed the Atlantic to help feed the newly formed American colonies. As settlements evolved along the East Coast, uh, they would harvest wild game as well as domestic animals, and those products would be 
sold fresh or if they were going to preserve them, they would use high amounts of salt, put that in barrels. In colonial New England, butchers used salted beef to build an important export business, trading meat for West Indies molasses. As the colonies grew, the retail butcher shop became a fixture in every community. Butchering was done on a very local basis because there's no refrigeration. Um, and also because the sort of mass factory system had not yet been put in place. Most cities had major stockyards or markets. Where local butchers would buy the, the livestock and then take them off and slaughter them, and then the meat would be served fresh. But by the late 19th century, the American butcher was engulfed by the Industrial Revolution. Large stockyards built for exhibiting and auctioning livestock began expanding in Midwestern cities like Cincinnati and Kansas City. But it was the railroads that ultimately ordained Chicago, Illinois, the meatpacking capital of America. By the 1860s, nearly every major railroad line passed through Chicago, making a large centralized stockyard a dominating economic force. By 1860-61, Chicago took the title from Cincinnati and became the pork butcher of the world. The endless pens and cattle runs encompassed more than a square mile of land on Chicago's south side. To process the multitude of beef cattle and hogs arriving by train, large packing houses were erected, some of them as tall as eight stories. The original uh, packing houses were driven by gravity. That is, livestock would be taken to the tops of buildings. There they'd be slaughtered, and then their bodies would be carried down on an uh, inclined plane uh, to the various departments until they'd end up in the lower basements and the chill rooms. By the 1890s, meat packers employed overhead chain conveyors to transport the carcasses from the kill floor through a maze of specialized workers. Chicago packing houses also invented a huge byproduct business. From animal hides, bones, blood, and organs, packers created profitable markets for goods, including lard, fertilizer, glue, soap, and leather products. The number of cattle killed in Chicago went from 224,000 in 1875 to more than 2.2 million in 1890. Les O'Rear took a job on the disassembly line at the Armour Packing House in 1932. And here's the uh, squeal of the hogs and uh, the heat of the day and the animal heat. And uh, there's a, a great noise going on, but there's this inevitable movement of the conveyor belt. Never stops, never stops, never stops. Ten and twelve hour days were not uncommon at all. In fact, 10 was sort of normal. You worked Saturdays too, you know. Maybe it was a half day off for Saturday. And uh, you doesn't miss your cut because then that will stop the line. And there's hell to pay if you stop the line. In Chicago's famous packing houses, the butcher's job was fragmented. Well, the butcher, of course, became one of 200 men. <laughs> Uh, you know, the original job of a butcher was to slaughter and dress the, the beef. Uh, these were very skilled men. Uh, but if you were going to make money uh, in slaughtering large numbers of animals, you cut the jobs down so that unskilled workers at the turn of the century were getting about 14 cents an hour. Uh, the men who were very skilled were getting about 50 cents uh, uh, an hour. Chicago's packing town rose to dominance in part because of the development of one major technology, refrigeration for shipping. For many years, natural refrigeration using ice cut from frozen ponds preserved fresh meat for weeks on end. The problem was shipping it. In 1875, a Massachusetts cattle dealer named Gustavus Swift opened a packing house in Chicago. Knowing the potentially huge profits of shipping fresh meat to eastern markets, he perfected the first refrigerated rail car. These custom cars were loaded with block ice at the slaughterhouse, then reloaded at various stops along the route. Swift's experiment created the market for Chicago dressed beef, a term that described a fully processed carcass delivered fresh, hanging on a hook.
The first meat that Swift brought to the eastern markets, uh, local butchers who were making money slaughtering their own cattle uh, refused to handle it and called it embalmed meat. There was an awful lot of uh, bad publicity about this. There was this talk of western embalmed meat and Chicago selling uh, sick beef on the eastern markets, but the beef was cheaper. Uh, in fact, Swift basically said to his agents, make it as cheap, if you, even if you have to give it away, uh, so you can get a foot in the market, and he did. In 1906, author Upton Sinclair published a novel called The Jungle. Sinclair hoped to draw attention to the miserable working conditions of the packing houses. But the book had a very different impact. There's 13, maybe 15 pages of meat processing in the book. And those 13 or 15 pages of meat processing is what really struck the public. But it had a tremendous impact because it hit them right in the stomach. You know, this is what I'm eating. You know, this kind of stuff. And he's talking about men falling into vats of lard. He's talking about fingers being chopped off and going out as uh, hash. Uh, he's, you know, all, all this kind of stuff. The resulting outcry helped bring about the Meat Inspection Act of 1906 and the Pure Food and Drug Act, both passed within months of the book's publication. Together, the laws brought huge changes. All animals had to pass an inspection by the newly formed United States Drug Administration. All carcasses were subject to post-mortem inspection, and cleanliness standards were established for all phases of the job. For the next 75 years, Swift, Armour, and other Chicago meatpacking giants controlled much of the industry. But as sure as transportation technology built the Union stockyards, its further revolution also tore them down. Because as they become no longer dependent on the railroad, that is, neither for bringing their livestock in or for shipping their meat out, you have refrigerated trucks that are moving along the new highway systems. Uh, and you get this massive decentralization of the industry. Today, the only remaining evidence of the world's largest meatpacking enterprise is the original Stone Gate on Chicago's south side. After 106 years of continuous operation, the Union stockyards officially closed in 1971. But the packing houses evolved into highly automated regional processing plants, where the final product is no longer a side of beef, but a box of beef. Today, the traditional butcher's livelihood is threatened by the fast-cutting, pre-packaging skills of a mass production army. Chicago was once the center of America's massive meatpacking industry. Today, Chicago's legacy is scattered across the Great Plains in states like Minnesota, Nebraska, and Iowa. Feedlots bigger than many of the local towns now provide the animals for a business worth more than $80 billion annually. According to the American Meat Institute, U.S. production of red meat exceeded 38 billion pounds in 1990. The butcher's craft is now a sophisticated alliance of man and machine, a high-speed mass production disassembly of traditional meat products and a staggering assortment of processed meats and inedible byproducts. The industry is, is very efficient in terms of, of how they utilize all the parts from an animal. There's very little waste. It all starts with steam cleaning, a process that removes dirt and other contaminants from the hide. The animal's hide is removed by a mechanical hide puller, and the 1,300-pound carcass is halved using massive backsplitter saws. The large sides of beef are kept in cold storage for a number of days. This allows the enzymes to break down the meat before cutting begins. On its journey to the knife, each carcass is graded for quality and yield by highly trained USDA graders. The graders examine the ribeye portion for the dispersion or marbling of fat cells. Select beef has slight marbling. Choice offers modest marbling. And prime grade beef contains the best dispersion of fat and fetches the highest market price. The marbled fat is what gives the cooked steak much of its flavor. In 
recent years, the human eye is being replaced by a video grading system in many plants. This imaging device calculates color and marbling of fat and assigns a quality grade in seconds. Prior to cutting, many processors inject nitrogen or other gases into the carcass to help separate muscle from bone and make disassembly easier. We have a carcass coming in and we will take certain parts off and they will go down one line, another set of parts will go down another line. We'll have people that are specialized in, say, pulling out a strip loin and then cutting it into steaks, for example. A modern meat processing facility is much like any industrial workplace. Safety is a major concern. Because of repetitive motion and the speed of the lines, the mass production butcher wears a vest and gloves of chain mail to avoid potential accidents with the razor sharp blades. A vast majority of the butchered beef cuts are primals or large portions, such as the sirloin or the chuck, that will be further processed into retail cuts. In large processing facilities, all of the large primal beef cuts are sent to the packaging department. The first vacuum packaging technologies were intended to remove air from around a meat product. The lack of oxygen inhibits bacteria and helps to preserve a sterile environment. Today, the vastly improved vacuum packaging technology is critically important to butchers and consumers alike. We're seeing more and more products being vacuum packaged, consumer-ready products that are very convenient. And it ranges from luncheon meats and cured products, things like that, because it has the ability to maintain the color of those products. At the University of Illinois Meat Sciences Lab, researchers are looking at ways to improve upon a much newer technology known as MAP, or Modified Atmosphere Packaging, a process of modifying the atmosphere around the meat by injecting a mixture of gases. And one of the thought processes was to increase the shelf life of fresh meat in the retail store was to add oxygen to the gas mix so that the meat cut looked like it was a bright cherry red or to give it its natural color. University of Illinois researchers also study an industry movement called enhancement. Enhancement is a process in which meat products are injected with various solutions to improve palatability. Typically, you will find salt, phosphate. Sometimes they'll use a natural flavoring, like rosemary, that has some antioxidant characteristics. And many products will contain either sodium or potassium lactate. What it does is obviously adds a little bit of, of flavor, a little saltiness to it, which enhances the meat flavor. But maybe more importantly, it changes some of the characteristics of what's called the protein matrix and it opens that matrix and allows for more water protein interactions and uh, that also allows the meat to become more tender once it's cooked. Researchers experimenting with different enhancements use both mechanical and human taste testers. Using an Instron device, shear force is used to measure the tenderness of various cooked enhanced steaks. Consumer taste panels are also used to measure the palatability of different injected solutions. From these blind taste tests, researchers can gauge what new recipes will appeal to the mass market. Meat enhancement for many chicken, beef, and pork products is a well-established practice. But what about the meat that the butcher trims from the primal cuts? Trimmings are a key component of the all-American cookout hamburgers and hot dogs. Hamburger is, is a, a process where we're going to take um, cuts of meat, lean meat, and we typically will add what is known as trim. And so these are higher fat content um, parts of the animal. And we will blend them in a specific proportion to give us, say, a, an 80-20, a 90-10 lean to fat ratio. Some extra lean hamburger contains even less than 10% fat. But hot dogs have a fat content of more than 
Although that doesn't stop U.S. consumers from eating more than one million tons every year. These beef or pork products are made with an odd assortment of animal parts. There are federal guidelines for the amount of meat and, uh, and or byproducts that go into a hot dog or a sausage. Uh, the, uh, the labeling is uh, such that it will tell you, for example, a beef hot dog has to obviously have beef in it. It's, it's certainly a wholesome product. It's not something that you may want to see on your dinner table in, in its original form. But uh, generally, when I say byproducts, maybe some liver or organ meat or um, parts of um, a pig that uh, you ordinarily wouldn't want to eat, for example, cheek meat or you know snouts or whatever. Sausage is the oldest processed meat product. For thousands of years, we've used salt and animal intestines to preserve and encase meat for later consumption. By the 11th century, European butchers began specializing in sausage making, and it soon became a highly regarded art, with recipes passed down from generation to generation. Today, most sausage making is performed by the mega processors. High-speed production lines allow the industry to produce over 1 million tons of hot dogs every year. But not all producers pump out millions of pounds every week. Some family-run producers focus on quality rather than quantity. At Usinger's in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Old World Tradition meets a modern yet limited production facility. We employ about 100 people, and we are basically a very large butcher shop, more so than a, than a highly automated um, facility and we try and keep our recipes as authentic as they were three generations ago. So that means we don't use a lot of uh, processing aids such as monosodium glutamate. Uh, the onions we use are fresh onions. We use fresh garlic. At Usinger's, meat, water, and fresh spices are mixed and combined in a grinding machine to create a unique sausage emulsion. In manufacturing a fresh sausage, um, a refrigerant such as dry ice is often added during the chopping portion, and that is to keep the meat very, very cold during chopping because the chopping produces friction, which produces heat. But it's very important that the meat stays cold during chopping so that you have particle definition between the fat and the lean because in fresh sausage, the, the product has to look its best because site sells. The emulsion is then put through a stuffing machine. Here, processed edible animal intestines act as the casings for the sausages. Usinger's sausages are hung on racks and smoked in a smoking chamber for a period of days, completed to the unique specifications of three generations of sausage makers. When you're making specialty, you're trying to differentiate yourself from the mass-produced product. And I think that the American consumer is awakening to that fact and being a more adventurous eater. But specialty meat processors share one very grave concern with the large mass production butchers. It's a terrifying new threat that cannot be seen or tasted, but still has the power to kill. Despite major advances in technology throughout the 20th century, the trend toward mass production of meat created the potential for new threats to the expanding population. As the corner butcher gave way to industrialized meatpacking, the chance of spreading an outbreak of disease over a wide area increased dramatically. The most commonly recognized foodborne bacteria are Campylobacter, Salmonella, and E. coli. Up until the 1990s, the USDA regularly inspected all slaughtering and processing facilities in the United States. However, a major outbreak of E. coli in 1994 of more than 500 confirmed infections caused a re-examination of sanitary guidelines and practices. In the mid-90s, meat processors began adopting a set of practices known as HACCP. HACCP stands for Hazard Analysis Critical Control Points. The system was originally developed in the 1950s for NASA to ensure the safety of food in the space program. And HACCP is a process 
by which the, the manufacturer or the processor is involved in providing safety for his products. He designs a plan to assure the safety and then basically the government supervises or oversees that he's following the plan that he's developed. HACCP consists of seven steps, which can be applied to any butchering operation to ensure food safety. Under USDA guidelines, every meat processing facility in the United States has to implement and follow a HACCP plan. The Great Western Beef Company is a portion control house receiving large primals from the packing houses and cutting them into high-end steaks for hotels and restaurants. Great Western rigorously monitors their plant, following HACCP guidelines. Uh, when we start first thing in the morning, uh, I do a pre-op sanitation. We check all the equipment, tables, cutting boards, lugs, carts, uh, hand knives, utensils, etc. Uh, check for cleanliness of the equipment. At Great Western, processing area room temperature is taken three times a day to ensure a 40-degree environment. Meat products are sampled for temperatures every 30 minutes, and each day random samples are trimmed from packed boxes and sent to a USDA lab for pathogen testing. Since the government has started testing for E. coli, it has dropped dramatically. Products that I have coming in-house, I have never tested positive for E. coli. Each night after the meat cutters finish their work, the cleanup crew takes over. They use 180 degree water, they rinse, foam everything down, hand scrub all the equipment, rinse again, then they apply a sanitizer, either a quaternary or a chlorinated sanitizer. We alternate to ensure the effectiveness of both. In response to demands for food safety, large volume meat processors have adopted many new technologies. The automatic hide washing cabinet treats cattle hides with a high-powered antibacterial spray to remove dirt and bacterial contaminants. High-pressure steam vacuums remove excess fluids. Next, a dilute organic acid wash similar to vinegar kills any residual pathogens. Before the rapid cooling process, workers check each carcass with the Verify system, a powerful black light that can detect any stray specks of organic contaminants. Workers continually trim product samples and swab work surfaces. An on-site lab facility cultures these samples and checks for any bacterial growth. Every butcher needs to be especially careful with ground beef and hamburger products, as they tend to have a much higher incidence of foodborne illness than muscle cuts of meat. One of the reasons that hamburger sometimes is, is suspect or, or gets singled out more commonly as a suspect in, say, foodborne illness outbreaks, it's a mixed product. It's not a whole muscle product anymore. And if you think about a whole muscle product, say a steak, that intact muscle is, in essence, sterile. And the only place that it can be contaminated would be on its surface. Hamburger, on the other hand, because it's a mixed product, if there were any bacteria on the surface of those original meat products that were ground, they're now in the inside of that product. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention recently announced significant declines in illnesses caused by E. coli, salmonella, and campylobacter. But even as sanitation has improved, a new menace has emerged that threatens the worldwide beef supply. In December 2003, the U.S. Department of Agriculture announced that an adult cow in Washington state tested positive for bovine spongiform encephalopathy, also known as BSE, or mad cow disease. BSE is one of those deals. Um, it was not a matter of if it would get here, it's when it would get here. And it didn't take long for it to finally get here. BSE is a degenerative disease that attacks the central nervous systems of cattle, destroying brain tissue, and eventually causing death. Many scientists believe the disease is caused by a malformed protein that has been named a prion. Prions multiply by converting normal protein cells into abnormally shaped cells that eventually clog the entire brain. These misshapen proteins are infectious, but cannot be killed by cooking or freezing. 
scientists believe the disease has spread among cattle through so-called animal recycling, the use of cattle parts in commercial cattle feed. Nearly 100 people have died from a human variant of mad cow disease, probably from eating infected beef products. The disease is carried in nervous system tissue, like the spinal cord, and is most likely found in products like sausage. Early symptoms in humans include insomnia, memory loss, and dementia. Currently, there is no known cure for this fatal disease. In the US, the Food Safety Inspection Service has taken numerous steps to ensure the safety of the beef supply. It's something we all have to watch out for. Um, the laws and rules and regulations since that the first one was found out in Washington has changed a lot of the way we handle a lot of beef comes in here. So without a doubt, we will improve the safety and the wholesomeness of the food products that are coming to our table. I feel very comfortable in saying we probably have the safest food supply in the United States of anywhere in the world. Experts agree it will take a very concerted and focused effort on the part of both large and small butchering operations to eliminate the threat of mad cow disease. The traditional butcher is a survivor in a changing business. When I was a, a boy in the 1950s and in you know, the early 1960s, I lived in an inner city community which had maybe 10 butcher shops in a walking distance. Uh, those butcher shops would have sawdust on the floor and it was a place where people met. That has shifted. Now you go to the supermarket and you pick something out in a plastic container that is wrapped and it may be frozen, it may not be frozen, but it certainly isn't processed in front of you. Today's factory cut vacuum packaged meat products have forced the traditional butcher to seek out specialized niches in the meat marketplace. Chicago's Polina Market is a classic specialty meat market for urban consumers, determined to maintain the tradition of face-to-face -face contact with the butcher. When you go to that supermarket or superstore, you're looking at a lot of uh, things that have been pre-cut, not by the butcher shop, not by the people working there. Uh, boxed beef came along, and now they're into centralized cutting. Centralized cutting has cut out the, the, the us. We start with the whole cattle. We work our way down. We, we trim it. We, we make all the portion cuts. And when a customer comes in here, they can actually talk to a butcher who can tell you what to do with that and how to cook it and how to prepare it. Another type of niche butcher is unknown to millions of city-dwelling consumers. This country butcher sidesteps the large packing houses and deals directly with a family farmer. Eichmann's Meats in Seward, Illinois, is the small farmer's slaughterhouse. We are what they call a custom processor. It's almost like being a custom tailor. Uh, local farmers will bring in a beef to us. We'll slaughter them, we'll hang them and age them for about two weeks. Then we bring them out, cut them as to their specifications. And then we process it, freeze it, Give, them, give the customer a call, they come in, pick them up, and take it home for their use. Sometimes delivering livestock from the ranch to the slaughterhouse isn't practical. In cases like this, another niche butcher steps up. He is called the mobile butcher. My job description is um, A to Z. You know, we go out, slaughter the animals, um, so I'm in there doing that. I'm also in there cutting and wrapping the animals, processing it for the people the way they like it. Getting to the farms on Washington State's tiny Lumi Island means taking the ferry from the mainland. The 28-foot mobile processing unit, or MPU, contains everything the mobile butcher needs for his long day. Typically, the customer um, with this USDA mobile unit has the opportunity to have us come right to their farm, um, slaughter their animals under inspection, therefore allowing them to further retail their meat. The day begins by leveling the MPU on the uneven ground to ensure that fluids will drain in the proper direction. Next, the sanitation process begins. We have two different sanitizers, one's for organic and one's for non-organic. And this is the quaternary, which is non-organic. 
and we have an iodine sanitizer for organic. So we spray all the surfaces just to kill any bacteria that might be present. With a clean environment, the mobile butcher turns his attention to the dirty work. This is one of the stun guns, which if you can get close enough to the animal, we can use one of these. And it just has shells like this that you, you pop in the end of it. And there's a, a pin in there, which will stun the animal. Now we gotta find the animals. <laughs> When an animal can't be restrained for a short-range job, the butcher uses a single bullet. Just as his predecessors did for thousands of years, the mobile butcher removes the hide and processes the animal without assistance. Despite the remote location, an on-site USDA inspector oversees the day's work. Using a variety of knives and electric saws, a single steer is dressed in approximately two hours. At the end of the day, the butcher cleans and sanitizes tools and the MPU before departing. He will later turn the animals into cuts of meat for the farmer's freezer. You know, they're getting what they want. They don't have to go to the store and just say, well, that's what I'm gonna buy. No, they can actually create different cuts, um, different styles of, of cuts. The processing plants have forever changed the world of the traditional retail butcher. Some wonder if that world can continue to survive. Are we a dying breed? Yeah. Uh, I really think so. At uh, one time in the city of Chicago, there was a tavern and a butcher shop on every block. That's gone. There's a few of us that have survived, and, and uh, uh, we're here to supply those that appreciate that difference. It's the deft skill with the knife, the intimate knowledge of the product, and the secrets handed down through generations that may ultimately save the traditional butcher from extinction. As long as there's a demand for quality, there'll be a...